It's really good to be here with you all tonight. Thanks for coming. I, I want to start by asking you, when you are working on a project and it gets hard, what is it that keeps you going? We're building things, vision. right? A vision. Sorry? A vision. A vision. A vision keeps you going. Say more about that. Yeah, it's almost like it's got a kind of gravity that draws you towards it. If you've got a picture of the future that's right, you just, it's going to keep you going even. What else? What keeps you going? What keeps you going? Passion. Say more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this kind of fuel. There's a sort of fuel that expresses itself in our work. And that fuel comes from something, some possibility that grabs us. What else keeps you going? My team, my community. Uh-huh. Yeah, say more about that. What happens? What keeps you going? What keeps you going? Yeah, there are people that you're serving. There are people who your project is about their life. And, and in a way, sometimes that's part of the vision. But it's the, the people on whom, on whom uh, this, this, the, for whom this project is, is delivered. What else keeps you going? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a sort of sense of accomplishment that um, goes a long way. Just seeing, we got this much done. I'm seeing this thing add up. What else? I go lighter. I go for a walk or I get a good night's sleep. And time it keeps you going. Yeah, so a break. Some reconnection with something else. My feet on the ground. Air in my lungs. Yes. It's possible. It's going to happen one way or another, and if I stay with it, I'll be there for that way. This, is, this, this feels better already. What about? Yeah. Yeah, where does, where does the energy come from for that commitment? How, do you, how are you able to keep showing up for that? Yeah. 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 Where does the passion come from? Is it rooted in the people that we're serving? Is it rooted in the folks with whom we are bonded in this adventure? Is it rooted in, in being able to share with people that something's possible and we're seeing it take shape? I want to suggest that at the root of everything we're talking about is others, is something human. Let me ask a second question. We're going to make the talk tonight out of these two questions. So here's question number two. Where do you get your ideas? If you're trying to figure out what to do, where to go, where is the reliable source of inspiration? Where does the idea come from that lets you know where to go? Where does it come from, sir? Yeah. Yeah. That the group, the group itself has 
has a mind, has, has an intelligence, has wisdom. And when you're together in a certain way, and you're describing it in a way that actually sounds fun, we're together, ideas are flowing, people are, are there for each other, there's play, and something happens. Where do your ideas come from? When you need the idea, where are you going to get it? Oh, well, I think it's also part of the, when you have a group that really gels together really well, it's greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. Greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. What else? Sort of a, a creative flow. You see the possibilities and the other bit. They're there and show up. They sometimes just come together in unique ways. Yeah. Just being present with what's there. Showing up, showing up, let stuff talk to you. And, and we get to that state sometimes by clearing out of our head whatever desperation we, we happen to brought, brought with us, whatever urgency we feel about where's the next money coming from or how am I going to find someone to. And suddenly we're back and the puzzle pieces are there. We've had this experience. So there's a sort of flow and, and it's almost like a letting go. Sometimes it's when I'm letting go of my ambition, I'm letting go of my drive, that a moment happens where my brain is able to receive something. Good. Where does the idea come from? Where, does, where do we get the inspiration? Uh, cultivating interests. Yeah. Say more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So whatever it is that you're interested in, whatever experience you've had losing yourself in the flow of some creative process, whatever you've loved is potentially the raw material of the problem you're going to solve next. Yeah, this is stuff we know. Anybody else? Something I'm missing. Where does the idea come from? Where does the idea that you need come from? Where does it come from? Yeah, good. All right, I'm going to make the talk out of this. I'm going to make the talk out of this. The question that Ruben gave me to consider is how do we find the kind of work that only we can do? The kind of work that we're going to be able to have fuel for. The kind of work that we're going to see play out in some powerful way that, that we care about, the kind of work that will draw others to us, that will bring a sense of purpose and accomplishment, and the kind of work in which we, we uh, potentially can lose ourselves for stretches of time, work that's worth doing because it makes a difference, work that's worth doing because it uses all of us. Those, I think, are ways of talking about work that are appealing to us. It's the kind of thing that most of my students in business school, most of the people that I work with um, in business, that's what they want at the end of the day. I want to make a difference that matters to me and I want to use my whole self up in doing it. Now, that's a pretty big thing to shoot for. And I don't recommend that, that, that there is any sort of framework or simple step program that can build that kind of life of meaning. I want to suggest, on the other hand, that the kind of entrepreneurs that you all want to be, people who get ideas that are brilliant, and people who are um, able to be refreshed and sustained over the long, hard work of building something that makes a difference that's worth doing, that this comes from practices that we cultivate that become the soil in which brilliant things grow. And I want to tell a few stories that touch on these points as a way of offering you all some perspective from my own limited experience about things that seem to work in helping us get the direction and the motivation to do this kind of work. First thing. Uh, I was a, a teacher at the Acton School of Business and we were giving our students this test called the Highlands 
inventory where you figure out what are your skills. And these are skills at a really basic animal level, like your finger dexterity and your ability to distinguish pitches and rhythms. And these are some of the raw materials of what make human beings able to do certain kinds of things. And I think there are like 35 of these on this test. So she called me to ask me about my test results, because I had taken the test first as a guinea pig. And she said, are you OK? <laughs> I said, why? She said, well, most of us who take this test, the kind of good life people, typically have one area of these 30 that they're in the 99th percentile of. And that is a really outstanding thing. Because when you've got one of these areas that you're at the 99th percentile, you are going to find work that is satisfying that is rewarding, that can make a difference, and there are all kinds of jobs out there that are going to track you into it. She says, the problem is the people who have two. And she says, that would describe a lot of entrepreneurs. She says, people who have two of these things have, it's like a, a system of equations that's overdetermined. It's not clear what you're going to do. You're not going to find an off-the-rack way to employ these abilities, these skills that, that, that are going to make you feel satisfied. She said, if you've got one of these 99th percentile abilities and it's not employed in your work or in something that you're doing, it's going to start acting out. It's going to make trouble. He goes, these are the folks that get in trouble, is the exceptional 99th percentile folks who don't manage to employ that ability constructively. She says, I'm calling because you've got three. <laughs> and I want to know what you do with that. By now, I feel like I'm very much a problem to her. She says, I said, so, you know, wh what is this notion of, of having gifts? She goes, no, it's not about having gifts. It's about having a problem to solve. So I tell you this story because I imagine a lot of you can identify with this, that it's hard for us to find one thing to do that seems to use all of us. And, and when we tested our students, we found that a lot of them had this multivariate problem. And therefore, they were working mainly to solve the problem of how do I engage myself constructively, productively, wholeheartedly, lovingly in the world in a way that uses all of this so that I don't have a bunch of unemployed stuff over here acting out. And I want to encourage those of us who aspire to do work that matters in the world that one of the reasons we're probably restless is we've got a hard problem to solve. How do we use our whole self? Therefore, I want to start by saying that your knowledge of the things that you are unusually good at is the first bit of self-awareness that helps you have enduring motivation in whatever you do. Because one of the things that causes us to give up on some long road that we've started down towards a beautiful vision is that it's not using enough of us to keep us engaged. And therefore, finding ways to identify the pieces of you that are not employed and to get them employed is part of our sustainability as creators and entrepreneurs. And so finding the people who know you best and ask them, what is it? What is it that you know that I'm unusually good at? What are the parts of me that you know have to be in my work? And I found in working with my students and the folks that helped me when I was young, all along the journey, that conversation is itself inspiring. And when I've worked with people in middle age that are having trouble finding work that matters or finding trouble sustaining themselves in some mission that, that, that is worthy, I often ask them, what part of you is unemployed? What part of you have you not yet figured out how to use in this work? And in answering that question, often people come up with really good ideas about how to change what they're doing in a way that makes it more powerful, more effective, more sustainable. So the first bit of advice that comes from experience working with people trying to solve this problem is the more you can know about the parts of you that are 
so strong that they have to be in the mix, that's knowledge that's going to make your work sustainable. And that awareness is going to give you ideas for how you do this work related to this. All right, so now you are all these multivariate folks. You've got stuff that you're good at and there's more than one thing and the reason that you're doing entrepreneurial work is because there's no one place to plug in that's going to make the difference that you care about. So the second thing is how do I actually figure out a way to use all of this stuff? And in this particular case I learned purely by accident that by doing the things that you're doing the best you can in isolation of each other people will teach you how to put them together. So for instance, if you're someone who, whose imagination is unusually good at putting stories together, if you're somebody who's unusually good at making food work in some brilliant way, if you're unusually good at empathetically discerning the story that someone's trying to tell but having trouble doing it, well, wherever you are in that 99th range, if you decide that you are going to be doing that, whether or not it's part of your job, people around you, like-minded people, passionate people who care about the folks and the needs that you care about, will see you doing that and they will say, come try this. I see you're really good at this. Have you ever considered? Or you'll start getting invitations. So putting yourself out there before you know what this has to do with your work, even before you've connected it with your mission. If people see you in brilliance and in passion, even in small doses, sharing photography, listening empathetically, making music, caring for children, whatever it is that is that genius, when they see it, the, the, the collective, the community will start to teach you where to put it. So my own experience with this was I knew from, from very early age that if I wasn't doing theater, I was always going to be cranky. And I knew that if I wasn't teaching, and teaching business in particular, that I was going to feel like my brain wasn't fully used because those puzzles lit me up. And I also knew that I was really interested in the big questions in theology and spirituality. I had to be doing that. And so I didn't worry early on about how this was going to be a job. I did worry. Well, that's not true. I worried. But my mentor said, stop worrying. If you want me to work with you, you have to stop worrying and just show people what you can do in each of these areas with very small commitments each week. So I spent two hours down at the coffee house doing these little pieces I wrote. I spent two hours at the seminary in a class with, with priests learning about ethics and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to be the best teacher I could and learning in the way. But what's, what happened next was the thing that I really believe in. The community is trying to help us become the best versions of ourselves. You're going to get plenty of invitations, of course, from people who see that your talent is useful to some end they have, but there are also going to be plenty of people that feel your heart that share the big vision you have about people that you're gifted to love and care about that are going to say to you, I see you're good at this. Would you come try this with me? It's an experimental invitation to come do stuff. And my best friendships have grown out of that. Offering something, putting it out there, letting people see it, and then have them say, I have another piece of the puzzle over here. Let's work this way. My experience with this has led me to a troublesome discovery. It is troublesome because it is so deep and I am so committed to it that it now pretty much directs what I do and how. And it is this, that the purpose of business is being with other people. That the purpose of work is communion. The purpose of all this stuff that we're doing is to bring us together so that we can be with each other. My, my grandmother says the biggest problem we have as human beings is what do we do with each other? What do we do with each other? She says that's why we have canasta. <laughs> you know? That's why we have, you know, rumba. That's why we have cooking. We have this to give us something to do with each other because we are, we are social animals, even more so than the chimpanzees. We are driven to be in a clump. 
We are driven to be in connection, in beautiful you know, interrelationships that, that share talents and make amazing teamwork possible. We are wired for that. And business, social enterprise, art, all of these things are just excuses to be together. And because I now see that and can't unsee it, it affects how I work. It affects the kind of things I say yes to. It affects the kind of projects I take on. And I want to encourage you to consider the, um, the, the possibilities of that. That if in fact what we're really doing, the main purpose of it is communion with each other, how will that change the way we work? So I show up today at business, I've got a problem to solve, it's part of a longer project that has deadlines and a big scope and people depending on me. And what if as I'm driving to work I tell myself the purpose of work today is being with people and enjoying them. The purpose of work today is learning from whatever connection someone offers me. The purpose of work today is to see a gift that's being presented. I want to suggest that I still get everything done. I'm still going to meet my commitments. I'm still going to advance my projects. However, when it comes to those big questions we started with, what keeps you going and where do you get your good ideas, that way of being with people in the course of our entrepreneurship makes both of those happen better. You said yourself, our sources of inspiration, right? are all grounded in things that probably have their root in connection with others, in a sense of belonging, in the exchange of energy, in appreciation, in the, 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 the glory of being a collective species, all that wonderful stuff. And so what if we imagine that that's actually practical when it comes to motivation and direction? So. What kind of practices then help us make that real in our work? What kinds of practices help us be our whole self as we are growing into whatever work we set? I use this word practices advisedly because in my experience as a teacher, as a consultant, as someone who, who has a, a, a business, as someone who works with a lot of people with businesses who are making hard decisions, as someone who works with social entrepreneurs whose, whose visions are beautiful and compelling. I, I say this because I think in many cases we can get sidetracked, spiritually sidetracked with projects. And projects are risky because projects always have a component of the ego to them. There's something about something we set out to do or build or make that is always tied to what it is we want or what it is that we want to prove or show or some notion of heroism that is you know, a driver over short sprints. And in my experience, the ego can limit what we can accomplish. The ego for me is not an endless supply of energy. The ego is not a reliable ground for connection with others. And I don't get very good ideas when I'm focused on impressing you or proving something or surviving. So rather than thinking in terms of projects first, I want to make sure that whatever projects that I take on are grounded in some reliable source of inspiration. So before projects comes practices. What are the things that we are doing every day that keep us grounded in a reliable source of inspiration, in our connection with each other, in those parts of us that are driving our engagement with the world that must be employed, what are the practices that keep us going? And I'm going to suggest a few that I found to be reliable, and, and, and I want to start by asking you, what are some things that you do daily or regularly that keep you grounded in what matters? What are some things you do daily, regularly, that keep you grounded in other people and in deep meaning and in paying attention to what's trying to happen? 
What are things you do? So there's a practice of this. So it's an expression of faith. The expression of faith is that in space, good ideas show up. So I'm gonna express that by making space. And so what I'm doing to live into that is I have a practice, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'm gonna sit, look at the wall, let my eyes go out of focus, let my thoughts clear, right? So there's a practice. What other practices keep you grounded or integrated? Yeah, so say more about that. I'd like to do the stream of consciousness early in the morning. It's sometimes a kind of a combination of sleepiness and dreams, but it's just an honest kind of question about the day to come. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for those of you who know the work of Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way, she's got a really nice description of a basic writing practice that makes room for the different parts of your life to talk to each other so that you can just pay attention to what's trying to happen. And there's something about clearing that out that's another version of making space. Sir? Uh, yeah, good. What, what, tell us about that conversation. Yeah, there's a practice. It's a practice of touching a source of wisdom that you trust, that you know is reliable, that loves you, and that touch keeps you grounded. Anybody else have a practice that seems relevant? Yeah. I do something so I call three daily questions. Yeah. I ask uh, myself in the morning, what will I do to care for others? What will I do to care for myself? What will I do to care for the earth? And then at the end of the day, I kind of look back and say, what did I do in those what did I do? It keeps me sort of open. I'm attentive to things during the day to see what comes. And then I'm sort of trying to hold myself accountable to that at the end of the day. I love that. What did I do to care for myself? What did I do to care for others? What did I do to care for the earth? And it's a question. It's, a, it's kind of like the practice of St. Ignatius, where you're examining, you're examining both your aspiration in the morning and your actions in the evening and asking, what did I do? Th th this is really interesting. Peter Drucker wrote an article about St. Ignatius's examination practice. And he said, it's what the most successful business people do, is they ask themselves the question of what am I going to do? And then they ask the question, what happened when I tried that? And just that rhythm of looking forward and then looking back regularly opens something. Somebody else had a practice, sir. Yeah, yeah. So can you give an example? Yeah. I think that's great. Now, I'm surprised that with one exception, we haven't yet talked about practices of being with others. We've talked about the important practices of clearing our minds, of reviewing our frameworks, or looking forward and backwards on our, our, our core animating values. What practices do we have for being with others that are particularly fruitful for this work? I have friends in Bali who go to the Malay a lot and they sent me a pall of beans and I put them on every morning and I'm not sure but I think of a, a friend that's on the other side of the world every, every morning when I wake up. Yeah, and, and what does that practice yield? There's a, there's a connection that's not just local. I mean, we're, we're here together but my, my friends, my heart can often be not here. It can be with others who are present physically. Yeah. Yeah, so wearing beads or carrying a picture or something that physically connects you to someone somewhere else that puts a piece of you there is a practice for a broader awareness of life that must bring both connection, motivation, and, and direction. What else, please? Uh, I'll with my daughter. Yes. She's with you, I'm not, I love her picture, Yes. I for me. Yes.
Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So making ourselves the students of younger people, what do they see? That, that for me as a teacher has been the most reliable source of inspiration. What do younger people see? And can I see it? Will they trust me with it? How do I learn to learn from them? Yes, exactly. You had one? Wow. Yeah. The, yes. This is strong. Yeah, just the intention of I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to let you talk more. It's a simple thing you can pay attention to. And it's a practice that for me is very fruitful of good ideas. Yes, do you have one to add? Uh, yes. Work with children in foster care. Yes. I work with them directly. So when I have a bad day, I just go through the Heart Gallery of Central Texas and look at their pictures and read what they how they describe themselves. And that brings back you know the reason that why am I doing this? Why am I putting up with the adults that? <laughs> me? It's because of the kids. So, um, but I like browsing the pictures. Sometimes you, you get updates to see who has been adopted or not. Yeah, it's good. In a way, it's kind of like this, the, the people that we are working for, how do we make sure that we are present with them in a way that they are for us an enduring source of inspiration? Good. So this is rich. This is the stuff we're talking about. I want to tell you about three of my practices, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So one of my practices is um, to go to places in town when I have to buy something that I don't usually go to. So I'm looking for places that are not where I live to go fill up my car and make sure that while I'm there, I am present to what is life like here, that I'm receptive to being taught there, and I'm having some pretty rich experience. Or if I have to buy something and I've got a, a little extra time, I'm going to drive to a place where I don't know people, and I'm going to pay attention, and I'm going to connect with whoever it is that I trade money with, and I'm going to see what it is that they may have to say to me and perhaps invite life to speak to me through that person. And those are rich experiences. The second practice of being with other people that I have found extremely fruitful is related to yours. It is listening for the clues of what people want to talk about. This started one time when I was hanging out in the airport and I was overhearing people talking and they were saying things to each other and, and they were always talking over each other or talking about what they wanted to talk about. So the conversations had a lot of energy, but they didn't seem to go anywhere. And I would hear clues, like someone mentioned, yes, that's, it's like the problem my sister had. And the next person said, well, you know, my sister has a lot of problems. <laughs> and the next thing you know, all this wonderful connection was gone, and all there was was this desperate barking at each other. So I decided I would listen, even when I didn't have the courage to follow up, I would listen to see, what is this person trying to tell me? My grandmother, one of her proverbs, was people are always trying to teach you how to love them. People are always trying to teach you how to love them. Well, if that's true, what if I decided I was teachable? What might I learn? And the, uh, uh, I find these two practices, going someplace with the intention of learning and listening for the clues that people are trying to give you. Really good ideas are coming, but more than that, motivation comes from that because it keeps me engaged with human beings in a, in a particularly fruitful way. And I find that when I do that, the work that I do every morning when I write or what happens for me when I meditate, what comes up, even what I dream about changes. I, I end by telling you my third practice my third spiritual practice for entrepreneurship is I pick up trash in my neighborhood. There's always more, it never ends. And when you pick up trash at first, you just sort of hate people. <laughs> and all the stuff and their disregard for other people and themselves. And, and then you get curious about where did this come from? How did this come to be here? And then you get really interested because you look back down the street and you realize you're doing something that only you can do. And even though that's not going to care for this big community immediately, even though this is not going to build a project that can carry a lot of water, there's something about that gesture of how you're being with people 
and pain and brokenness and possibility that prepares your muscles to do bigger work. So I want to encourage you to think about the practices that you have for clearing space and for letting others in as inspiration because it's out of those practices that you're going to have the capacity to do the work in which you are the best version of yourself. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you.